Say your name again. Dusty. Dusty.
Sure I'm on. Can you do me a favor and just make sure I'm on? Okay. There's two of them. There's a second one. All right, so I'm gonna go test the mic. Test, test, test. Okay, test, test, test. You can hear it on there as well? Okay. Boy, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming to Technology Day. My name is Amir Dabirian. I'm the Vice President for Information Technology. And it's such a treat today that we have our first after COVID Technology Day. <laughs> and it also, we have a treat. We have Mr. Keith McIntosh with us. You will be blasted by his presentation today. I have listened to his presentation uh, in a, during COVID time, and I just thought we have to bring Keith on our campus. So we're very, very, very lucky to have Keith with us today to give us an ex excellent presentation on inclusive leadership. Uh, let me introduce him to you officially. I got the, his official bio. I, they asked me to do a short bio on Keith because we have a long, long bio on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't read that. That's boring, please. <laughs> Uh, Keith McIntosh is the Vice President of Information Technology and, and Chief Information Officer at the University of Richmond, where he has served since 2016. Prior to joining the University of Richmond, he was a CIO at Ithaca College and CIO at uh, Pima, yeah, Pima County Community College District, and held various progressive IT leaderships positions. In the Air Force. And, yeah. In the Air Force. In the Air Force. And served at, at, at 20 years, 24 years of service in the United States uh, surf, uh, Air Force, including the combat tour at Northern Iraq. Uh, I want to, again, thank Keith for coming from Virginia here, and welcome to Technology Day. Keith, by all that. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. All right. So I'm going to try something. Uh, usually I bring speaker notes. And it usually keeps me prompted, and there's usually a display that kind of keeps me prompted what I'm going to do today. I hope you all will give me some pause. I'm going to try to do this totally off of this. And I can guarantee you, now that I'm 60 years old, this doesn't always work as I like it to do. So if you see me pausing and shuffling to go back, just like, what was I supposed to say on this slide? Please give me a little bit of break there, okay? So first off, Keith McIntosh, I am so happy to be here. Uh, you know, I think it was... Um, almost two years ago when Amir and Robin reached out to me, and every time I was having a chance to come do this, it was gonna be virtual, it was gonna be in person, it was gonna be virtual, then it was gonna be virtual, it got pushed back because there was an outbreak here. And so I'm glad I'm finally be able to get here in person and see you all and do this. I think it's better to have these types of experience and conversations in person. Second thing, uh, please call me Mac. You know, I said all my friends do. I tell people that usually when I hear the word Keith, it's usually because my mother or my grandmother or my wife is scolding me, so please don't use that term with me. <laughs> we'll be amongst friends, we'll go by Mac. So today, I'm going to divide my conversation in probably three parts, right? So uh, first part of the conversation will be focused on 
some boring stuff, kind of like some definitions, and kind of ground us in what we're talking about when we start talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, right? So you know the frame I'm coming from, right? I had advice after I've given some of these talks before where somebody, you know, I made the assumption, bad on my part, that everybody knew what diversity, equity, and inclusion was about, and I just rolled right into my talk, and the person came up to me, and he had the most negative feedback, as he said, you never described what diversity, equity, and inclusion was about. And I said, you know what, that was honest, candid feedback, and I will never do that again. So that's how we're gonna start. Then we're gonna move in a little bit, talking about inclusive leadership. Then we're gonna talk about why I choose to lead inclusively, right? And then the last part of it, I'm gonna show you several of examples, and I cut the, there's some stuff on the cutting room floor that I didn't put in here, so you've been spared. But I just wanna share some of the examples of what I've done and what I try to do to lead inclusively and why I think it's important. Fair enough? All right, and then there'll be time to open up the floor for questions at the end. So the first thing we want to talk about is these three terms, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right? What are they about? The simplest term is to think about diversity is just about the differences. Right? Uh, but when I think about differences, there's so many things that we can think about. A lot of times we think about what we can see, but there's a lot more that we don't see. All right? And each and every one of us bring into this room each and every day multiple aspects of our identity. Right? I stand here as a black man. I stand here as a heterosexual, I stand here as an educated person, I stand up here as a married person, I stand up here as a, as a veteran of the military, right? And I can go so on and so on and so on, and so can you. So when we think about diversity, oftentimes folks are thinking about uh, binaries of like black and white, white and Hispanic. I'm trying to think of much broader, thinking about the gender, your education, where you live, right? All those things come into play. When we think about equity, it's about promoting justice, right? It's trying to make sure that everybody feels like this is a space where they're gonna be treated fairly, right? And have the same opportunity as the next person. And the last part is inclusion. And for me, inclusion is kind of an outcome where diversity is this kind of numbers, differences, things of that nature. Equity is a little bit more moving to action. Inclusion is really focusing on outcomes, right? Are we having inclusive outcomes? And if we do all three of those right, if, then I think we'll get belonging. And belonging to me is this kind of a state of mind, a state of being where I feel like I know that I feel like this is a place where I can bring my fullest self to work or to school or whatever I'm doing. So inclusive leadership, when I think about inclusive leadership for me, at a broad level, it's about coming in the door, every, waking up every morning, coming into work, thinking proactively how I want to engage with everybody I have a chance to engage with. And what does that mean exactly? So when I come into work and I think about, am I going to be an inclusive leader or not, I constantly think that. And how can I do things in, a, in an inclusive manner? That, that would include things about how I greet you, simple as that, but it also includes things like how I run a meeting, right? Do I make sure that every voice is heard in a meeting? Do I make sure that credit was given where credit is due in a meeting? Right? Do I allow that that person take the lead and I, t and I follow in those types of situations? Those are the type of things I talk about when it comes to inclusive leadership. And as I said, I want to make sure there's some points I want to give to you, because I wrote these down ahead of time, and I think these are important for you to hear. And then lastly, the last piece is uh, empathy. Now, for me, leadership has always been about head and heart. And what do I mean by head and heart? Am I moving on too far? when I go that far up? Okay, I like to move about. Head to heart, so a lot of times when you lead people, there's a conscious way to lead people. There's a way to think about, hey, these are the things we wanna get done today. These are the things I'm gonna ask you to do. These are the things I'm gonna to wanna to work with you about. But also I think there's a way to connect with people emotionally and empathetically, right? Because we're not robots, none of us are. We're human beings, right? We have emotions, we have things that are going on in our life. And heck, the pandemic definitely proved that, right? When you got insights of what was going on in people's worlds, right? So there's much more that's going on than what we often see. So I think for us to be effective leaders, we need to be aware of how to interact with somebody from a conscious level, but also from a more empathetic, connecting, compassionate level, right? And I think when you do both of those well, now you have the best opportunity to understand the person, the persons, the teams that you're privileged to lead. And when you do that, then you're much better prepared and better able to have uh, an inclusive environment, create a sense of belonging, and I also would say better outcomes. Does that make sense? But enough about the way I think about it. So I'm gonna stay here to make sure I read this. So there are experts who talk about inclusive leadership. Now I will say for me, 
I was active doing things with DEI in, in, well before I even know what the term was. Right? I, I, I'm not even going to try to uh, quote when DEI came to be in existence, but it just made sense to me that as a leader, and I learned this from my father, and I want to talk a little bit about James L. McIntosh a little bit, because I think he was the first person that I really got to see do things and how he interacted with people. And, and no matter where we went in the world, somebody always, he always knew somebody and somebody always knew him, and they had such a passion and affection for him. And I was like, how did, that, how did you do that as a leader, right? And he used to talk to me about how he would connect to people on an emotional level, and, and it was the caring and the compassion. He would get things done, but it was the way he worked with people. So I said I wanted to model and emulate those type of things as well. And so for me, when I think about uh, the inclusive leadership, I've been doing it for a while, but there are experts out there who say uh, that, that, that are much smarter than me, and I just want to share what the experts are saying, all right? So this is, if you take one thing away, you can, I saw some of you taking some notes, take this away. There's six traits that, there are, that are part of inclusive leadership. And it was Bernadette Dillon, Bernadette Dillon and Juliette Burke who authored this, and they put it in, uh, they both work at Deloitte, and they put this in Harvard Business Review. The first one, starting at the bottom left, is commitment, right? When you think about commitment, it's really about the objectives, my personal goals are aligned with what we're trying to get accomplished. So I'm committed to DEI. I think the next one is courage is probably the toughest thing because I know most folks, once they become aware that there are injustices in the world, the next step is to be able to act when you see an injustice. And the thing that really prevents people from doing that is when they are scared or fearful that something's gonna happen, so it takes some courage to step in and lean in. And I think what we need to do is always have the opportunity to say, like, as a leader, you have to step into that, uh, that scary space, that uncomfortable space. You have to be able to step in and say, this is wrong, and here's why, here's a better way. So you have to have courage. Cognizant of bias. Myself, you, we all have biases, okay? That's not a bad thing. I mean, I think this is the way the human psyche is set up to be able to manage themselves in the world, right? So you can get a sense of what's about to happen, so you can make some kind of judgment. The challenge with the biases is, is when they rule the day, right? When our biases become so present that we form an opinion, and then our thoughts and our actions are based on those biases, and those biases are rooted in something that's incorrect, right? So if I have a bias that black people are not as intelligent as white people, in everything that I say, and everything that I do, that's gonna be what's gonna come out of my leadership. If I think that same-sex couples shouldn't be in the workplace, that's gonna come out in everything that I do, right? Those biases, right? But if I am cognizant of my biases, and I had a bias that really ran with me for a long time, and I'll share it with you, as a person who grew up in the military, I grew up as a military brat. My dad was in the Air Force and I traveled around the world. My mom had extreme, I love my mom, but she has extreme biases. And before long, the biases of your parents can become your biases. Does that make sense? And I didn't realize that until I was like becoming a young man and I started dating and I started looking at the ladies that I was most interested in looked a certain way. And all the other beautiful ladies, I never looked at. Because my bias was I had to look at black women only, right? Now I'm trying to have a real conversation. I hope that doesn't scare anybody. But hopefully that's making a good example. <laughs> but I'm married to a white woman now, right? And, and I think it take, you know, so one of the things I had to do as a young person at some point in my life is go, why do I believe or why do I think or why do I do what I do? Where did this come from? Is this legit? Do I want to live this way? Do I want to have these biases rule how I interact with people each and every day? And I go, no, I don't. So from then on, I made a conscious choice. I'm giving you some examples that are outside of work, but the same thing happens in work. And I'm going to talk about an example here later when I talk about Ithaca College and what we did there. The other thing is curiosity, right? So curiosity to me is extremely important. I went around this morning and I said hi to folks. But it was tough for me because I'm an extroverted person and I would have loved to stop and talk, and Felix knows this, I'd love to stop and talk to each and every one of you, right? Get to know every one of you and I'm like, dang, this would probably take me 45 days. <laughs> but I'm curious, right? Who are you? What makes you tick? Where you come from? And I guarantee you my curiosity helps me grow and learn as a person, right? Because once I learn something about you, 
I may not remember Me Too again, but there might have been something you shared with me that in a future interaction with somebody else, I can draw on that conversation and that interaction and go, oh, I kind of kind of get what you're saying, right? And or in a situation where things are coming up and I don't get to, I'm not in a room and I'm reading a policy or I see things going on, I can say, wait a minute, I, I feel pretty confident based on cultural curiosity and questions I've asked of people, this might have a negative impact. So let's make a change. Does that make sense? So I think I'm always trying to be hungry, always curious about what's, what other cultures are about. Culture in cultural intelligence, and that's the result of it, right? I have this thing that I say, Felix may have heard me say, and I'm pretty strong about this, but I think a lot of us that are in these leadership positions, like me and Amir, right? I'm not saying Amir, but I'm just saying others at this level, can arrive at this level doing the things that it did that were successful at mid-tier and moving up through the ranks, and get to this point where they're not as intelligent about cultures as they should be. The demographics of our country are changing rapidly. The demographics of our student body is changing rapidly, right? So for us to be effective as leaders, to be as effective as working with individuals and colleagues, I think it's important for us to be culturally curious, but also culturally have, hum have some humility to learn about other cultures. Not what you get fed in your social media, not what's said in your local conversations, not what's said in the mass media. What do you know for certain, right? So cultural intelligence is something that can be developed. You can do this on your own by trying to, re there's a lot of wealth of resources out there, but I also think things like what you're, having doing, what you're doing here today is fantastic, right? Because I see sprinkled throughout the day are things where you can go and learn and grow and build your cultural intelligence. And then lastly, collaboration. Now, for me, it's a big part of me. I stand here today 100% confident that the way I arrived to be a leader in this world was working collaboratively with people. Hands down. Now, I can imagine there's probably other ways to get to be successful and be a leader in the world, but for me, I want to draw on the strength of each and every person on my team, right? So I have to let that be known that I, that's how I work from the beginning. And then my actions each and every day have to support that, right? If I say, hey, I want you to be a part of the team and I want to collaborate, but every time you speak up, I shut you down, did, I, did my actions follow my words? No, right? And in addition to that's how I do, that's what my expectations are for my direct reports and pretty much everybody on my team. So when I see things or I hear things that are run contrary to that, I do not hesitate to come in and speak to people and get things course corrected right away, right? I feel like the success we have is because we have really smart people, all with great experiences and backgrounds. I need to draw on those strengths and bring everybody out where in the best world, and it happens with me at my last couple of, well, everywhere I've worked actually, but Great evidence here in my last, my current institution is when we're discussing something, a decision hasn't been made, I share a viewpoint, and the junior most person in the room can look at me and go, Mac, I disagree, here's why, and I say, yeah, let's talk about it. And then we end up going that direction, right? So I think those are the six characteristics that they had talked about, and I know I moved away from the slides, so they were up there for you to look at again. But I will say, for me, it's a privilege to lead, right? I try to lead, and when I think about leadership, when I say inclusive leadership, I probably should have said this earlier, leadership to me is not about a formal leadership role like CIOs like me and Amir hold. Each and every person in this room is a leader, right? The first thing you do is you're leading yourself each and every day. Then you have the privilege in your sphere of influence to influence those folks that are near and close to you. So because of that privilege, right, I take that very sincere. And again, I'm gonna talk about head and heart. I wanna be able to connect in, with you in a way that what we say and we're going to do means it, it, it logically connects with what you're thinking as well, but I also wanna get down into a deeper level, which is visceral, and that's the emotional level, right? So I wanna connect in both those two levels, and that's what I'm trying to do with you here today. I want to read this quote from Scott Page. 
and he talks about diversity. And Scott Page is an outstanding individual, and I would encourage you to, encourage you to check out his book called The Diversity Bonus. Uh, he says, problem solving, strategic decision making, creating and innovating, teams win. Diverse teams beat homogenous teams. And he goes on to say, only if there is an inclusive environment for diverse teams to do so. All right, so now we're gonna move into a piece of the talk where I think I'm gonna move away from my notes and you might see me walk around quite a bit, all right? Um, something that's near and dear to me before I get into anything college is, it troubles me when I see somebody being marginalized. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'll say it again, it troubles me when I see somebody being marginalized. And I've been the type of person, well, I, I'll speak truth to power. You know, I'll, I'll be willing to risk it all, and I've done such those type, the, those types of things in my past. When I think that folks are genderizing women, cut that crap out. If folks are marginalizing lower socioeconomic status people, cut that crap out. My staff knows I don't play on that, and I'm, I'm seen as a leader on my campus, but we're doing a lot on our campus, and individual members of our team are picking up the baton and doing their work as well, and helping to bring and lift up the institution. I'm going to talk about Ithaca College. That's where I was at for just two short, two short years. When I arrived in, in, at Ithaca College in 2014, they had an event like this too called um, Tech Day. Uh, but up until my arrival, they had never had any guest speakers come to Tech Day. And so one of the first things, before I get into that, there's a story I should share. When I first come into any organization, the first thing I do is I do a group call like this, and I would stand up in front of the room, I'd have pictures of my family, and I would tell people about myself, I'd tell people about my journey, I'd tell them what I like, what I dislike, I'd tell them I suck at golf, but I like to play it every day, <laughs> things of that nature, right? And, it, and what I'm trying to do is demonstrate inclusive leadership from the get-go, right? I'm trying to express, I'm trying to connect, I'm trying to share information with you. Then the second thing I do is I work with my assistant to schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each and every person, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. But when I got there to Ithaca College, when I met with folks in a one-on-one, -on -one, a theme popped up from my conversations with the women on our team. And I think my team was about 20% women. And they said it differently, but they were talking about, oh, there's a lot of genderism in IT, there's a good old boy system in IT. I say things in the meetings, I don't get credit for it, then a guy says it, and then they get the credit for it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure ladies have probably heard some of those types of things before. Guys, we suck, we do it all the damn time, and we need to stop doing that kind of thing, right? They're just as talented as anybody else in the room. So when I met with the team, and I got that information, I will say it wasn't as widespread, it wasn't with every man, but it was enough for me to say, you know, as a leader, and as somebody who espouses inclusive leadership, I must take action. I must do something. So what am I gonna do? So uh, I, I, first thing I did was I had one direct report, uh, a woman on my team, and she approached me and said, Mac, I wanna create a women in IT group within, uh, our organization. I said, sure. Because of my connections in Educause, I knew the, the, the persons that were chairing the Women in IT constituent group, Deb Keek Fredson and Beth Schaefer, and I connected those, two those three ladies so they can get the program up and running. And the next thing we did was we brought in two dear friends of mine, Claire Vandeblink, who was the uh, CIO at the time at Pace University in New York, and then another dear friend of mine, which was Katie Vale, the late Katie Vale. She passed away in 2015, but she was the uh, CIO at Bates College. And they came and gave a talk to a packed room of faculty, staff, and students about women in leadership. And so I really centered the conversation and put lead women up front so men could you know, feel that and see that. And then the next thing they did is they had a private conversation with those ladies uh, with our women in IT group. But the issue still persisted, so I said, you know, I have a really great partner on my campus, There's, as you do too, you probably have sociologists and psychologists and great folks on your campus, and one of those warriors in that space was Dr. Belisa Gonzalez, and uh, she used to say something to me that sticks with me to this day. She says, we must get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? And if we stay in, the, in our comfort zone, we'll never grow and develop as individuals, right? And so we have to get uncomfortable with topics such as dealing with whatever that thing is that troubles you, right? We have to lean into those spaces. But we decided, we put together a uh, group of two women, two men and myself, 
uh, as a diversity standing committee. We met with um, Dr. Gonzalez for about two months to kind of plan like a six month monthly series of conversations that talks about gender, right? And I remember when we got together, this is how the men rolled in. How do you think the men rolled in? They were excited? The women were excited. The women were the first ones there. How do you think the men showed up? Oh, come on. How you, they, well, I'm going to put on my best Academy Award performance, right? So I'm going to pull this chair out. until I walked in the room. And then when I walked in the room, I said, no, you know, they were sitting where they wanted to sit. I said, nope, we're sitting, we're mixing you all up. So the clicks that we have, we're breaking up all the clicks. There are gonna be women at every table. Men, you're gonna sit with men that you don't normally sit with. And this is what we did. When we got about, I don't remember if it was the second or third session, it went from this to this with the guy. And then it went to this to like this with the guy. Then it went to this, like, they were all expressive, they were all in, right? So what I, what I like about that is, you know, it, it, it takes leadership, it took a little courage, but it took a little help from assistants like Dr. Belisa Gonzalez, but eventually the men got it. You know, the best thing for me is when the men were saying, you know, I do do that. And I didn't know I was doing that, and I'm so sorry I'm doing that, right? And just hearing that, you could see the countenance on the women's faces go, Thank you, finally, right? And then the next thing was just reinforcing that behavior as we move forward afterwards. Now, when I went to Richmond, and I'm very fortunate to be at the University of Richmond, proud. We're the one and only spiders in the country. I'm proud of that, <laughs> right? If I would have been wearing my uh, jacket, I would have worn my spider pen. My daughter has arachnophobia, and she's like, Dad, dude, of all the schools, you had to go there. So I said, no. Um, I, I love it, and we're very fortunate. You know, we used to be, when I first arrived there, we were top 30 school, 34th in the nation, National Liberal Arts, and we just got ranked in 18. And I feel like I've been a part of that growth, and all of us there feel proud of that effort. Uh, one thing I will say is the environment at Ithaca College and the environment at Richmond were entirely different. When I arrived at Ithaca College, um, it was in the height of what was happening. There was a lot of racial issues happening across the country. Uh, you remember there was the um, hunger strike, I think it was happening at the University of Missouri, and there was other incidents around the campus. We were having the same thing at our campus. So what I was trying to do was in the context of that, and even at our campus, it had reached a plateau such that on one day, women, I mean, all students left their classes on a day and went out to their main lawn and, and laid down, and it started to rain and they laid down. It was their protest to, uh, to, to actual racial protests, as that was their demonstration. So that's the context. When I arrived at Richmond, I have very fortunate to serve under African-American president, Dr. Ronald Crutcher, he hired me there. The environment was starting to shift based on the last couple of presidents and diversity, equity, and inclusion was becoming much more prevalent. So what I do, at, and I set that as a context, to be honest with you, because what I do at the University of Richmond is, is grounded in that ability to have that set up, that environment. And it's sort of like for me, I describe it as a bow wave for anybody who swims knows that if you're swimming behind something that's you know, pushing the heavy water out, it makes it easier to swim behind. And so that's why I think what I'm doing at Richmond has been successful. But we'll talk about a few things and I'll be happy to ask you questions when we get to the end. We created a, you know, we created a, a DEI committee and the committee has been going through a couple of iterations, but I'm really proud of the work they're doing. The committee has been seen as a model on campus and oftentimes our president references the information technology, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee. So that makes me feel proud and it's not anything that I do. I, I show up at the meetings that they set up and they plan uh, events for us throughout the year. They also do things like send out communications. We have a weekly communication that comes out from my office. It's called the CIO Digest and every week they put something in it pertinent to DEI in there so folks can raise their level of awareness. They also take over our social media channel so they start publishing things via social media for us. Um, they also do things with communications around um, on campus with uh, technology as well. So one of the things we do recently is we've partnered, let's see, we do quarterly DEI meetings. And the previous one that I can remember, we did a partnership. I knew a guy, um, 
Felix wouldn't know who he is, but now I forgot his name, would come to me. He was at Harvard, he was at Harvard, Kyle Shemit. And he is uh, pretty much a foremost authority on accessibility at, at Harvard. So we partner with him and our dis disabilities office on campus to have a conversation on our campus with RIT folks about disability and accessibility. Last month, we had a conversation in partnership with HR and our mental health professionals about well-being. In January, a, a term that we talk about a lot is called belonging. I just met with my president last Friday. I said, you know, hey, president, we don't have this term defined yet. We need to define that on our campus. What's that mean? But we're going to have a conversation about belonging. I asked him to come along, and he said he's going to be there. So I really want to have a conversation within our team to do belonging from two perspectives. One is, what does belonging mean for us as IS professionals, IT professionals, working with one another? So what does it belonging mean to us? How do we foster a sense of belonging amongst our team? But I also think, and you probably have the same thing, we serve this institution, right? It's a privilege to be here. We provide technology and services for our faculty, staff, and students. But are we doing it in an equitable and inclusive way that's fostering belonging for everybody on campus, or are we doing it in a way that actually is working adversely to that? So those are the two natures, the two aspects that I want to try to do with my team. One of the things we did was we, we were members of, uh, we have a subscription to LinkedIn Learning. So we cultivate, we use LinkedIn Learning courses every year as part of our professional development. Well, since I've arrived, this is what it's been like. We do an annual performance review. We have to set out our annual goals, and everybody on my team, myself included, has to disclose their DEI goals, right? And they're gonna be accountable to those goals just like hitting the other goals that they have in there. One of those is the training and awareness program that we have for that. And so they will do, um, everybody took a certain course, and then the supervisors have to have a conversation with their staff about that course to make sure that they've absorbed the material. And then all the leaders have to take an, a, a, a learning path, which is multiple courses, and then I facilitate a conversation with the team to try to assess out where everybody is and their understanding of the materials that they've consumed. One of the ways that I get to know my team personally, and I'm sorry this is so small, but I, I, everywhere I go, I told you I said I meet with the team as a group, and then I meet with the team as an individual. So one of the things that I do is I have this bio sheet, and it's something I learned when I was in the military as a way, because when you're moving around in the military, you know, you have troops that are coming and troops that are going, and how can you get to know them real quickly? So this is something I learned I came up with, and I just adapted it and used it in my higher education career. So what I would do is I would take this template, which has criteria of things we want to hear, uh, you want to learn from people, and it has instructions, but then I fill it out first. I send a completed one about Matt to Amir. And then I say, Amir, I look forward to meeting you. And then my assistant, Michael Robin, will, M Melody, my assistant, will send something send it to them, and then they will complete it and send it back to me. When they send it back to me, I'll read through it, and then I'll usually find one or two or three things that I say, you know what, I can connect with this person with. And I'll respond, and I say, hey, I look forward to meeting with you in person. And then we meet in person for 30 minutes, most of the time it goes over, and then we talk about. And what it does is it helps the introverted person get a little more comfortable coming to see the VP. They can see and learn, okay, this is what, he, he shared a lot about himself, so I feel a little more comfortable. And so there's, Two things that I really take away, when I meet with folks and they come in the room, they're already armed with a little bit of information. They're already armed with stuff that they might want to ask questions about. And I learn a lot, right? Because I say, this is a meeting for you to ask me anything you want to ask me. This is a meeting for you to take anywhere you want. I don't have an agenda. I use these, this sheet to get to know you. And I learned a lot because folks can go all personal in that conversation. Folks can go all professional in that conversation. And some folks can do a hybrid of both. But even then, I've learned something. So I learned something by what they say, but I also learn a lot about what they choose to talk about and what they choose not to talk about, right? And so what I'm trying to do is just bridge the gap and get connected closer to folks. And I think going back to that model, I've hit on commitment, I've hit on courage, I've hit on curiosity, and I've hit on cult cultivating cultural intelligence to kind of wrap, bring that back. Now, something I'm extremely proud of, who here has heard of intersections outside of Felix? You have? You have? Where'd you hear about it? So I know you've heard about intersectionality. Have you heard about intersections at the University of Richmond? Anybody? Okay. So we're not as famous as I thought. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No. So um, intersections is a cross-cultural conversation that I started at the University of Richmond. Uh, it's a place where folks can come and have culturally 
intelligent, developing conversations about a myriad of issues in and around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We have talked about things such as the Me Too movement, critical race theory, uh, genderism, what happened on January 6th, um, taking statues down and monuments down. Anything that you can think about being discussed, this is a forum where we can come in. Now, I have experience being a facilitator, and so that's why I don't mind doing it. And I'll be honest, I modeled this off of something that I learned from my previous supervisor when I was at Ithaca College because we had such race relation issues on the Ithaca College that my boss, who's a Jamaican-American man, convened a large forum and brought people together for the campus. I said, I'll just do something like that for my team, and here's the reason why, why we got started. When I moved to, my wife, as I said, is white. We're an interracial couple, and we had the opportunity to come to Richmond, and we were thinking, hmm, do we really want to move to Richmond, right? Now, if anybody knows interracial marriages, there's Loving V, the United States. That was the landmark case in the 60s that, uh, that broke, that um, shot down, um, well, it legalized inter uh, interracial marriages, let's say that, right? And so there was that as a context. Then Richmond is also the seat of the Confederacy, the capital of the Confederacy. All right, and so my wife and I had a long, hard talk about moving from Ithaca College to Richmond, Virginia, because we were like, how, what is this environment gonna be like for us when we get there? And much to our surprise, when we made the commitment, you know, there's stuff everywhere. There are bigots everywhere. We ran into some situations, but not as big as what we thought we would, right? Overall, we've enjoyed it. And after about, say, a year there, we said, let's get out and see Virginia. So we went down to Virginia Beach, we went out to, to the mountains, and then we went to Charlottesville. Everybody said, you gotta get to Charlottesville, that's where University of Virginia is. It's about 60 minutes from our campus. So we drove up on a weekend, three weeks before this. Anybody remember this? Right? For those of you who don't know, that was the Unite the Right, Unite the right rally. And that was where white supremacists picked University of Virginia, and they went around walking at night with tiki torches and um, saying a bunch of crazy things, in my opinion. And then they had um, those tragic events the following day where Heather Heyer, and that was, you probably remember the motorist came down and killed that woman. So that's what this is about. That happened just 60 minutes, three weeks after I'd been there, walking the same space. So it was just surreal, it was eerie. It's like, gee, that just happened in our backyard. I came into work, and my assistant, what I said to her, I said, you know, you'll probably, when I first met her, I said, you'll probably hear and see things that I won't, so if you hear and see any things that you feel like I need to know about, let me know. And she said, Mac, people are talking about what happened in Charlottesville. And I said, okay, but they're scared to talk about it. So I said, let's get together. So I said, convene a meeting right away, all hands, let's talk. And it was just an open forum, and people were extremely quiet, extremely quiet. I was trying to draw people out, but I said, you know what, we didn't finish what we needed to do, let's come back next week, let's come back next week, let's come back next week. And then what that ended up rolling into is what we have today. Somewhere over time, we started meeting regularly and we went to a point where we have faculty, staff, and students who now join us. We got a name, right? But it just started with me having a conversation with my team to say, hey, let's decompress what we saw. And then I think folks, the reason why we're still in existence today and the reason why we still keep going today is because folks are curious. Folks don't have a place to talk about these types of topics, right? How many people, show of hands if you feel comfortable, have conversations growing up about race at the dinner table? Not a lot of hands go up. And most of the folks that I showed to put their hands up were folks of color, right? So. If we're gonna be in this world where we're gonna work with folks who don't look like us, come from different socioeconomic status, and we don't, and we learn everything. We learn, we're taught how to tie our shoes, put our clothes on, how to drive, but we don't learn anything about understanding who other people are, their cultures, their values, their background, what makes them tick, right? How are we supposed to be able to do that well, successfully, without talking about it, right? So Intersections is a place where we can come and say, I want to ask this question I've always wanted to ask, and I don't know what if, I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to learn, right? I think this is a fantastic place, and the reason why it keeps going is because I think folks are constantly, uh, constantly curious. And when we first met, we met in what, a building across the street from my building, which was a, a living room setting, and I wanted to kind of have it be like we were having a conversation at our dinner room, dinner, dining room table. 
And then uh, the pandemic hit and we switched to virtual. So that's why you see a picture of a virtual conversation. But actually I was fearful that when we went virtual, we would lose people. Actually, we started gaining people because what ended up happening was, was folks were saying, you know, you always meet from Wednesday noon to one. And I purposely picked that because that worked for my schedule. All right, so that was the one time I wasn't inclusive and I don't care. Because <laughs> I was like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it on my schedule. I can do this on a regular. That way folks will know that even if they forget what we're gonna talk about, I go, oh, intersections is today at noon and one. And then the pandemic hit, and then obviously we went virtual. What happens is now folks can say they have less time, they had less time to get across campus to come to the living room. Now they can say, I can just jump on a Zoom call and be there with you right away, and then I can go right away to the next meeting. So I like that. When I first started doing it, and we're, and so here's the thing, this is funny how we do, right? So we're a 4,000 student campus, nothing to the behemoth size of CSU Fullerton, <laughs> right? But everybody knows everybody. It's like a little mom and pop situation, situation, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where everybody knows everything, and so we're having a conversation within my division. I'm like, hey, this is just for our division. Next thing now, I'm walking across campus, hey, Mac, I heard uh, you guys are doing something, and like, where'd you hear about that? Like, who? They did say, they're not gonna say. And they're like, I'm in the lunchroom, like, hey, Mac, good things that you're doing over there. Could you do something like that for our division at like 8 a.m.? Like, who the hell is telling you this stuff? <laughs> no, I can't do that. I'm like, I'm one person, and you know what I really have? A day job called CIO, right? So <laughs> I better go do that one well. But I said, you know, what I can do is teach you how to fish, right? I'm not going to catch the fish for you, but I'll teach you how to fish. So I brought people together. I brought members of my team who had been longtime participants. We fed them, and we said, hey, here's what we do. Um, what do you want to know? And so we talked to them, and, and, and that was a great day because that, at that moment, that's when other things started to germinate, start to uh, take off on our campus. Now, we always talk about a lot of controversial topics. We plan, we in December and January, we plan the topics that we're going to do for the year. We do monthly themes, and so we take four weeks to unpack a theme. And we usually have, I'm the primary host or facilitator, but I don't lead. I think I lead maybe 20% of the conversations in a year because the rule is that everybody comes, has to at some point participate and lead a conversation that's, that's germane to them that they want to do. And we watch one film a year, we read one book a year, right? And so very fortunate that we've read one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I can do math. Um, the first book up in the upper left-hand corner, or Overcoming Bias, is by Dr. Tiffany Jana. It's a very short read. I highly encourage you to read that book if you don't read anything else, because I think it's the, the you have to start with the person in the mirror, and that, that, that's what that book does. Tiffany Jana was a local DEI consultant for Richmond, so we were fortunate to have her come and speak to intersections in person. Then we read Why All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria. That's a denser read, more of an academic read, uh, but we are also very fortunate when uh, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum came to our campus that she was able to visit with intersections. But I will say, they decided, like, when we pick these books, I don't pick these books based on speaker schedules. What I'm sharing with you, it's, it's kind of funny, serendipitously, when we pick a book, it just so happens later that speakers come into our campus, so we get to connect the dots that way. And that's what happened with why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria. Then we read uh, Better Allies, which is really nice, and I did reach out to this person and asked her to come and speak to us, and she came to a virtual conversation. Then we read What If I Say the Wrong Thing, another short read, because um, I think a lot of times folks are fearful, like, I want to say something, but we live in such a council culture. If I say something, I'm worried I'm going to get counseled right away. So she, she gives like 25 examples and 25 techniques that, that you can do to help you overcome that fear of saying the wrong thing if you're in a group. Then we took a little stretch. We read Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell, which was kind of a reach, but it was a good story, good read. And then this year, we started, uh, we always start reading around September, so we're reading currently Cast, The Origin, Origins of a Discontent. And boo, yeah, that book is something else. That book is something else. I'm not all the way through it. <clears throat> I will miss Intersections tomorrow because I have to get back tonight and I have to go to Philly, but we're in the middle of reading that, and I will say, Tell us that Amir doesn't even know this. Last night, guess who was on our campus? And where was I? Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. There's somebody in the room that cares and has some compassion. So, you know, four books we read and uh, six books we read, and four of the books, my team, the folks who come to intersections were able to interact with the author. My wife sent me a picture this morning um, with her. Uh, 
there last night. And it's not working. What's going on? All right, this isn't me. There we go. <laughs> All right, so we'll wrap it up real quick. So one of the persons, and so this is a point where I say, some people in the room go, oh, great. You did that whole intersections thing. You're a VP. You have convening authority. Most of the people can't do that in the room. And I'm like, uh, not so much, right? And here's a perfect example. So I'm going to brag on this lady a little bit, both these ladies. So the lady on the left is um, Hillary Appleton, and the lady on the right is Emily Saunders, two young ladies who worked in the advancement division of our college. Hillary was in the room when we did the panel. And she left that, she called, she, got, she, she caught up me, and she was fired up. She had this energy like, oh, oh, and I was like, no, she's the most demure person, but there was energy coming from her. And I was like, all right, all right, all right, I got you. I was like, let's set up a meeting. So we set up a meeting. She said, Mac, I'm fired up. I want to get something started. So we talked about intersections, how I set it up, how we choose our topics, the structures. I uh, gave her some advice and counsel about getting facilitator training. She enlisted Emily as a partner in crime, and then she talked to her, her VP, and her VP said yes. And they've created an intersections in advancement. Now, here's the kicker. They were like you sitting in this audience. Neither one of them had any practical experience. They had never done anything like this before, right? They just were fired up. They had compassion. They had courage. They had curiosity. And they said, this is something I want to do. So they did it. And they have now left the institution, but their advancement intersections is still going. And while I'm here, I want to brag a little bit on Hillary, because since she's left the college, she and her friend Christine Liu have created a podcast that talks about biases and what it's like to interact with other people. And so that should be, stay tuned, that should be published later on this year. And they asked yours truly to be their first guest, so I was very honored to be on there. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that turns out. And so for me, this is it. Those six things that they talk about. Now hopefully, and this concludes my talk, and I know Hector wants the cue. So there's your cue, Hector. Question time. <laughs> we can start, the, the best part of the conversation for me is to get your questions and try my best to answer them. And hopefully this was enjoyable and uh, didn't put you to sleep and you take something away from it, okay? But thank you for having me, Amir, I really appreciate it. Again, thank you, Keith. Any questions? Don't be scared. I'd love you to share advice of how you help others understand the difference between equity and equality. Equity and equality. Well, there's a lot of great captions and cartoons out there, right? Equal is just giving people, to, I give you a dollar and I give you a dollar, right? But you needed a dollar fifty. So I give you a dollar fifty, give you a dollar. That's equity. That's the simplest way to say it, right? Now we can translate it into a lot of things, right? So it can go a lot deeper. For me, this. This is probably not what you're asking for, but I'm gonna say it anyway. We need to be cognizant of that we all have arrived here with a lot of history behind us. There's been a lot of structures, a lot of laws, a lot of policies, a lot of actions that have informed who we are as a people here in the United States today. Some of those things have impacted people more adversely than others. That's what I truly believe, and I think there's data that backs that up. And because of that, giving things equally to people is not fair. It's, a it's a, an injustice to folks. We need to look at where people are, understand their lot in life, and then give them what they need to be as successful as what you give to the next person so they can be successful. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yes or no? Yeah, so the equal is, the, it, hopefully that was a very simplistic method, right? Um, the, 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 the cartoon dynamic that you often see is when they have three kids standing up at a fence. Anybody ever seen those? 
right? For those who haven't, basically it's saying there's a fits and you have three kids that are three different heights. You have equal number of stools for them to stand on or crates to stand on, right? Equal is giving them all a crate. The tallest kid could see over the fence standing without the crate. The middle kid can barely, the shortest kid cannot, right? So you readjust and reestablish the crate so the shortest kid stands on two, the middle kid stands on one, and the tallest kid stands on none, and all three can see over the fence to see the game. So that's an analogy that helps. Thank you. Uh, I, Hold I on. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, we could take the metaphor deep if we want to, and it sounds like that's what you're doing, brother, I appreciate that. You know, so there's, you know, there's a guy I know that talks about blowing stuff up. He likes to just, you know, like, let's just take that down. I'm like, well, you know, things evolve to get to where we are, so I'm a, I'm a more of a person trying to work within the constructs of what we have, right? So I think the best thing to do is, my role has always been to try to lift up and make people aware of the challenges that folks are doing. Once we now know aware, so let's just say like during the pandemic, we had folks that went home and we found out quickly, you probably did too, that well, most of you are commuter students here, right? But we have a lot of residential students and we're very hot. I mean, the academic river of Richmond is pretty high. And there were students who were having uh, food insecurities, technology insecurities, things of that nature when they got home and that was negatively impacted. Not all students had that, right? And so for me, from an equitable lens as a technology leader, it's like, we have to rectify that, right? What can we do to make sure that it's not equal, that it's equitable, right? So what resources can we bring to bear to help these students with a technology inequity so that somebody else is working with the food inequities? And so that's what I would try to do. I love the idea of blowing down the, the, down the fence, but if I take that into the real world, these structures have been around for a long time. And so how can we make people aware of the fence, maybe shorten the fence, work around the fence and then lift up and give people things. The best thing in the world is to build things equitably and inclusively from the ground up. But you and I exist in a world that things are here before we arrive, so we have to work with the construct of what we have, All right? Thank you, Keith. Do you Any have other questions question? on, the, on the Zoom? Okay. Any other question for Mac? I think that's your name, right? Yeah, you did. You can call me Mac. <laughs> well. Yes, sir. And I'll say one comment before I close, too, after we get done, Amir. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Timothy Foster. I'm from the Daily Titan uh, for the school newspaper. Oh, my gosh. There's students in the room. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So make sure you quote me right, brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> uh, really quick, I just have to ask you. Um, do you cons I'm recording the interview. Are you, do you consent to being recorded? This uh, is for the school newspaper? It's late now, right? I mean, you already started recording, <laughs> right? Uh, well, not test this question. Okay, yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah. cool. So you started a group called Intersections. Yeah. How has social media and applications like Zoom, especially during the pandemic, helped bring awareness and start a conversation about diversity even when we were stuck at home? That's a deep question, brother. I don't know if I have a good answer for you. I mean, the one... Th the I know you're trying to connect it with social media. I, I think, since you're recording, this is a tough one. Because what I want to say, I, I think I'm going to miss a mark. So let me just say the things that are coming to mind. I, just as I was just talking to this gentleman, I think we need to be cognizant of what is actually going on, be aware of what's actually happening, what are the structures, what are the policies, what are the processes that are in place that are impacting people positively or probably more importantly, negatively? All the technology we have can just amplify and make things happen really fast, right? So most often, what goes viral is something that's crazy or negative, right? And then that becomes the sound bite. And then that just reinforces all the negative uh, stereotypes and biases that folks have. So I think, you know, if I think I'm answering your question right, I think we need to be cognizant of what we're doing to be more strategic about putting more positive images, more positive communication. I, but I think I'm missing your question. That, that somewhat answered it. Um, what do others think? I'd love to open that floor in a room because maybe I'm just misunderstanding. What do other folks think about that question? Oh, he was talking about what about the inequity that happened as a result of the pandemic. Well, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I just really kind of talked about that. I will say that, you know, something else that I've seen occur, uh, and maybe this is in light of it, as a black man growing up in the United States, I've been called in words so many times, it's not even funny, right? And a lot of times when this happened, um, nobody's there to catch it or see it or hear it, but I did, and that person who said it did. Um, I remember one time I was in West Virginia, I was dating a girl from West Virginia, and we were walking downtown at noon, and I walked by a bar, it was kind of a honky-tonk bar, and the person, you know, music's blasting, and the, and the person yelled this information over the music outside. I'm, I'm probably maybe from me to you away, and I heard it like it was standing right here. So they really wanted me to hear that, right? Today, and then my connect us to today, today, with, the th with, with, with these, we're now capturing a lot of things that have been happening, you know? I, I don't think anybody wants to name their baby Karen today, right? Uh, and there's a reason for that, right? Because we see that there are things that are happening uh, that are injustices that have always been happening, always been happening, but now uh, we have the ability to bring light to those types of things. And I think folks like in your role have a responsibility to make sure that we're curating the right stories, positive and negatively, be truth sayers, tell the truth about what's going on, make sure we have the facts, right? And share information so it's a little more no, a lot, a little more, a lot more, a lot more nuance, right? Um, because without it, I think without folks videotaping what happened to George Floyd, I don't think um, there would have been convictions. Um, I don't think without the videotape what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, there wouldn't have been convictions, right? Um, but I also know that the pundits can wax eloquent about certain things in social media, and then that becomes a soundbite, and then folks who are not sophisticated enough believe that hype. That becomes part of their biases. That becomes part of how they see the world. That becomes part of what they think and act and do, right? And I think we need to dismantle those things and push back against those things. So I gave you way more, man. I am off the pulpit, ladies and gentlemen. Church is over. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Keith. I want to give you your last. Uh, you want to All right, I'm good. So the last thing I want to say is like one. Each and every one of you is a leader in this room. Each and every one of you have the ability to lead inclusively, right? I've shared some information, I've shared some examples, but it starts with you, right? All it takes is having a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of humility, and, and a little bit of, uh, of education and awareness to be able to see the injustices in the world and then call it out when you see it and make things better for other people. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest thank of the Thank you again. If, thank, you, thank you for coming, everyone. Yes, we have plenty of uh, programs in Technology Day. Please look at the QR code. Look at your diagram, I mean, your little pamphlet. Make sure you attend all other sessions. Thank you for coming. Thank you again.